Welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to discuss the effect of World War I both on American society at home and then the sort of course of the war abroad. So let's jump into this whole deal. Here are your basic objectives. Take a moment and uh, ab absorb them, please. And hopefully by the end, you'll be able to answer these in some substantive detail. So let's talk about how society was transformed. Obviously, mobilizing society to fight any war takes a significant amount of time and effort, but the scope of the First World War meant that the scope of mobilization also had to be massive. And so we're going to see all the things that we see in traditional wars, right? You're going to have to, of course, increase the size of the army. You're going to have to raise a ton of money. And in general, we're going to see women moving into more male-dominated fields. But, of course, the scope is going to be far larger. So uh, we institute, of course, the, uh, the draft again and start drafting people into the military. And fortunately, we just passed a law that or we just passed a constitutional amendment that allows a federal income tax to be created. And so we can use that to finance the war. And we don't have to worry about relying on tariffs, which, of course, our revenue from that took a massive hit because, again, you know, global war. So mobilization is a massive undertaking and transformative in itself. The federal government, of course, has to expand substantially in order to basically produce the things that we need. So we get something called the Council of National Defense, which is a huge government bureaucratic uh, agency that helps to organize all of these different things. So your War Industries Board, of course, pushes us to make fewer you know, cars and bicycles and make more shells. The Food Administration ensures that we can feed our soldiers and can ship all of that food overseas. The Railroad Administration is uh, pretty obvious. And the National War Labor Board is going to make sure that there aren't any strikes and that society and that uh, industry is going to continue to operate because, again, this is a total war. And so victory in World War I is almost as much a factor of how much you can produce as it is the actual fighting. Probably the most influential one of these organizations is the U.S. Food Organization, who, uh, who pioneered this massive campaign in order to ship all of these supplies across the Atlantic Ocean. Because, of course, we're going to put together a massive army and ship it a very long distance. And so logistics and providing food for those troops is a huge component of success. And so we get all of this fun propaganda, trying to convince people to plant their own victory gardens to preserve food and, uh, you know, to be responsible with what they're doing. Because, again, we want to ship as much of these products overseas, both to help feed our soldiers, but also, you know, to help our allies. So uh, we see this transformation here. Uh, the guy leading this is Herbert Hoover who's going to more or less uh, parlay this into a presidential run in about a decade. The other really influential organization is the Committee on Public Information, or the Creel Commission. This is the first uh, ever U.S. propaganda administration. And so they create all of this propaganda to help raise money for the war and convince people to go and fight. Probably the most famous of these, of course, is the um, one is the poster in the middle depicting uh, German militarism coming to the United States to despoil our maidens and destroy our society. And of course, we get the demonization of the Germans, you know, for some reason trying to equate them with central uh, European horsemen who burned down Rome. So Germans get to be Huns now. So that's exciting. We also passed the Espionage Act in order to try to um, basically uh, prevent people from criticizing the war and to, um, and to ensure the loyalty of American citizens. Specifically, of course, we were worried about the loyalty of Germans because of Germany was the primary enemy here. And so we're going to get Theodore Roosevelt going on some pseudo racist rants about how you need to give up your European, uh, you know, any sort of connection to your European ethnicity. We get uh, political cartoons implying that German Americans are secretly toasting the Kaiser while pretending to be loyal American citizens. And most famously, of course, we rebrand sauerkraut into Liberty cabbage and hamburgers into Liberty sandwiches because we don't want to be eating any of that German sounding food. So incredibly effective at fighting World War I. We also pass a new Sedition Act as part of this which makes it illegal to criticize the government in times of war. And so now we're going to, of course, uh, be throwing people in jail for criticizing the government. 
which is somewhat problematic and a violation of, you know, some of those early amendments in the Constitution. But it was deemed as a wartime expediency. And of course, you know, like all unconstitutional laws, someone eventually sued. And uh, in the Supreme Court case, Schenkt versus United States, the Supreme Court ruled the clear and present danger uh, sort of clause or definition, which more or less established that free speech that presents a clear and present danger to society is not protected. So the famous example, of course, is you can't shout fire in a crowded movie theater. And apparently you can't hand out pamphlets convincing people to resist the draft. So uh, Eugene, labor leader Eugene Debs is thrown in prison where he runs for president and is unsurprisingly not elected. So we're now curtailing speech in order to ensure that the Kaiser is defeated and democracy prevails. Also during this time period, we see the Great Migration expand quite extent extensively. We've talked about the Great Migration previously, of course, which is African Americans leaving the Jim Crow South for more urban opportunities in the North. But of course, the massive demand for workers of World War I simply expediates and speeds up this process. And so increasing numbers of African Americans now move to sort of urban enclaves in northern cities. And this is going to be uh, this is going to be a huge factor in some of the racial tensions that are going to rise after the war because uh, these northern cities are not any, well, are racist, are as racist as the South, but perhaps in different ways. So uh, we're going to come back to this. Just know it's a thing that's happened. As far as American troops actually fighting, the timing is somewhat fortuitous because about the time that the United States is jumping into the war, Russia is jumping out of the war, which of course is, uh, you know, explains the whole um, Zimmerman note and the unrestricted submarine warfare thing as a staggering and almost exhausted Germany is trying to launch one knockout blow now that they can move their troops from the Eastern Front. So the goal for American troops is to get there before the German hammer lands. Command of these forces is given to General Pershing, who's most famous for basically failing to find Pancho Villa in between uh, the U.S.-Mexico border. But he does much better in this war, and we mobilize huge numbers of troops and are amazingly able to transport them across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the increasing amount of government action and government coordination is really what makes this a very different experience from what we saw in the Spanish-American War with our trail of dead horses all the way to Cuba. And so we're able to successfully get our troops over there and get them into the trenches where they can then start dying because honestly, we don't know how to fight this war yet. And we didn't really want to listen to our European allies. So anyway. American troops, uh, when they show up, become known as doughboys because of how well fed they are in comparison to their European counterparts. Uh, obviously, millions of British and French soldiers have died, and so they're not exactly using uh, the cream of the crop at this point. And so Americans are much larger and plumper than all of the other allied forces. So we get uh, labeled as doughboys, which, uh, we take, which is sort of pejorative, but also sort of fond. It's complicated. Uh, our first couple battles go really, really poorly because, again, we're using human wave attacks against machine guns and artillery, which, man, not at all effective. But over time, we start to learn some of these modern military techniques, and we play a very key role in stopping the German offensive at the Marne and then launching the last 100 days offensive in order to, uh, in order to fight in the Second Battle of the Somme which is where the back of the German Empire finally breaks. It's important to note that uh, Germany was never occupied. Uh, with the, uh, Allied troops never marched victoriously into Berlin. The German government was simply overthrown, and then Germany surrendered on November 11th, 1918, at the 11th hour, all that fun stuff. This becomes known as Armistice Day, except uh, today we have changed it to Veterans Day to honor veterans of more wars than just World War I because honestly, there aren't very many of them left. So that's the end of World War I. Uh, honestly, I mean, I wish it was more exciting, but Americans only really come in at the tail end. And so uh, we do play a role in World War I, but it's not a huge one. Honestly, the bigger effect on the United States, I mean, there was a huge effect on the American government, but the Spanish flu then also spreads around the world near the end of World War I and then also in the aftermath. 
Uh, it's an incredibly virulent strain of influenza. And what was terrifying about the Spanish flu is people who were younger and healthy were dying in huge numbers, not just the sort of older, sick people who tend to die from your standard flu. Because of this pandemic, uh, we order a national lockdown, uh, mask wearing becomes common, and uh, we basically shut the country down. We go through several different waves of the flu until it burns itself out, uh, killing globally somewhere in the area of 20 to 40 million with um, significant numbers of Americans killed. So that's the effect of World War I on the United States. When we come back tomorrow, we'll start to unpack the aftermath and talk about uh, the long-term effects of this conflict.